Someone who shared my deep love of natural history and the history of science was Stephen J. Gould. I had read his Ontogeny and Phylogeny, and many of his monthly articles in Natural History magazine. I particularly liked his 1989 book, Wonderful Life, which gave one a tremendous feeling for the sheer luck, good or bad, which can befall any species of animal or plant, and the huge role that chance plays in evolution. As he wrote, if we could rerun evolution, it would no doubt turn out completely differently every time. Homo sapiens was the result of a particular combination of contingencies that ended up producing us. He called this a glorious accident. I was so excited by Gould's vision of evolution that when asked by a newspaper in England what book I had most enjoyed in 1990, I selected Wonderful Life. His vivid evocation of the astonishing range of life forms produced in the Cambrian explosion more than 500 million years ago. These had been beautifully preserved in the Burgess Shale in the Canadian Rockies, and how many of these had succumbed to competition, disaster, or just bad luck. Steve saw this tiny book review and sent me a generously inscribed copy of the book in which he spoke of it as the geological version of the sort of contingency, the inherent unpredictability, I had described in my post-encephalitic patients. I thanked him, and he replied with a letter crackling with his special energy, exuberance, and style. It began, Dear Dr. Sachs, I was thrilled to get your letter. There can hardly be a greater pleasure in life than learning that an intellectual hero has enjoyed one's own labor in return. I really do think that, in some collective sense, but obviously without any contact, several of us are working towards a common goal rooted in a theory of contingency. Your work on case study certainly goes together with Edelman on neurology, chaos theory in general, McPherson on the Civil War, and my own material on the history of life. There is, of course, nothing new about contingency per se. Rather, the theme has usually been seen either as something outside science, merely history, or, even worse, as a surrogate, or even a rallying point for an unscientific spiritualism. The point is not to stress contingency, but to identify it as a central theme for a genuine science based on the irreducibility of individuality, not as something standing against science, but as an expectation of what we call natural law, and therefore as a primary datum of science itself. After discussing several other topics, he concluded, Funny how once you get in contact with someone you wanted to meet for years, you begin to see things you want to discuss with him everywhere. Sincerely, Stephen J. Gould We did not, in fact, meet until a couple of years later, when a television journalist in Holland approached us to do a series of interviews. When the producer asked if I knew Steve, I had replied, I've never met him, although we've corresponded. But nonetheless, I think of him as a brother. Steve, for his part, had written to the producer, I desperately want to meet Oliver Sacks. I see him as a brother, but we've never met. There were six of us in all, Freeman Dyson, Stephen Toolman, Daniel Dennett, Rupert Sheldrake, Steve, and myself. We were each interviewed separately, and then, a few months later, flown to Amsterdam, where we were put in separate hotels. None of us had yet met the others, and there was a hope that there would be some wonderful and possibly violent explosion as the six of us came together. The 13-hour television show called A Glorious Accident was a huge hit in the Netherlands, and a transcript of the show became a best-selling book. Steve's own response to the show was characteristically puckish. He wrote, I am astonished to see that our Dutch series was so well received. I certainly enjoyed meeting you all immensely, but I doubt that I would have been inclined to spend hours before a TV set watching such a conversation among a group of folks usually characterized in these PC days as dead, white European males. Steve taught at Harvard, but he lived in downtown New York, so we were neighbors. There were so many different aspects to Steve, so many passions. He loved walking, and he had a huge architectural knowledge of New York City and what it looked like a century ago. Only someone as intensely sensitive to architecture as he would introduce spandrels as an evolutionary metaphor. He was extremely musical. He sang in a choir in Boston, and he adored Gilbert and Sullivan. I think he knew all of Gilbert and Sullivan by heart. 
On one occasion, when we went out to visit a friend on Long Island, Steve basked in the hot tub for three hours, all the while singing Gilbert and Sullivan and never repeating himself. He also knew a huge number of songs from both world wars. Steve and his wife Rhonda were impulsively generous friends, and they loved to host birthday parties. Steve would bake a birthday cake using his mother's recipe, and he would always write a poem to recite. He was very good at this. One year he turned out a marvelous version of Jabberwocky. And at another party he recited this. For Oliver's Birthday, 1997. This man who's in love with a cycad, but once could have starred in a bike ad. King of multi-diversity. Hip, happy birthday. You exceed what old Freud, past head psych, had. One-legged, migrained, color-blinded, awakening on Mars and hat-minded, Oliver Sacks still lives life to the max, while his swimming leaves dolphins behind it. On another birthday, knowing that I loved the periodic table, Steve and Rhonda invited everyone to dress as a particular element. I am rather bad at names and faces, but I never forget an element. There was one man who came to the party with my old friend Carol Burnett. I do not remember his name, and I cannot remember his face, but I will always remember him as Argon. Steve was Xenon, Element 54, another noble gas. I eagerly read Steve's monthly articles in Natural History, and often wrote to him about subjects he raised. We discussed all sorts of things, from the place of contingency in the reactions of patients to our shared love for museums, especially the old cabinet type. We both spoke out for the preservation of the marvelous Mütter Museum in Philadelphia. I also had a craving, which went back to my marine biology days, to know more about more primitive nervous systems and behaviors. And here Steve was an important influence in my life, someone who reminded me, incessantly, that nothing in biology made sense except in the light of evolution and chance, contingency. He put everything in the context of deep evolutionary time. Steve's own research had been on the evolution of land snails in Bermuda and in the Netherlands Antilles. And for him, the vast range of invertebrates illustrated even better than vertebrates the range of nature's inventiveness and its ingenuity in finding new uses for very early evolved structures and mechanisms of every sort. He called these exaptations. So we shared an appreciation for lower life forms. In 1993, I wrote to Steve of ways of joining particulars with generalities, in my own case, clinical narratives with neuroscience, and he replied, I have long experienced exactly the same tension trying to assuage my delight in individual things through my essays and my interest in generality through my more technical writing. I loved the Burgess Shale work so much because it allowed me to integrate the two. He was kind enough to read my manuscript for The Island of the Colorblind, and he did so closely, saving me from a number of blunders. Finally, we had in common an interest in autism. As he wrote to me, my reasons for respect are partly personal. I have an autistic son who is one of the great day-date calculators, instantaneously, over thousands of years. Your piece on the calculating twins is the most moving essay I have ever read. He had written very movingly about Jesse, his son, in an essay later published in Questioning the Millennium. Humans are storytelling creatures preeminently. We organize the world as a set of tales. How, then, can a person make any sense of his confusing environment if he cannot comprehend stories or surmise human intentions? In all the annals of human heroics, I find no theme more ennobling than the compensations that people struggle to discover and implement when life's misfortunes have deprived them of basic attributes of our common nature. Steve had had a brush with death before I met him, when he was forty or so. He had a very rare malignant tumor, a mesothelioma, but was determined to beat the odds and survive this particularly lethal cancer. He was one of the lucky ones, aided by radiation and chemotherapy. He had always been an extremely energetic person, but after this experience of facing death, he became more energetic than ever. There was not a minute to waste. Who knew what might happen next? 
Twenty years later, at the age of 60, he developed a seemingly unrelated cancer, a lung cancer in the chest that metastasized to the liver and the brain. But the only concession he made to illness was to sit while lecturing instead of standing. He was determined to complete his magnum opus, The Structure of Evolutionary Theory, and it came out in the spring of 2002, the 25th anniversary of his publication of Ontogeny and Phylogeny. A few months later, just after teaching his final class at Harvard, Steve plunged into a coma and died. It was as if he had kept himself going by sheer willpower. And then, having completed his final semester of teaching, having seen his final book published, he was ready to let things go. He died at home in his library, surrounded by the books he loved.